Hello, welcome to the Midweek Bible video. We'll be doing a question from the New City Catechism and then a reading from Thomas Watson, All Things for Good, and then we'll be finishing Romans 7 in our series on Romans. So first, question 24 of the New City Catechism, which we practised two weeks ago. Why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? Why was it necessary for Christ the Redeemer to die? Since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died willingly in our place to deliver us from the power and penalty of sin and bring us back to God. By his substitutionary atoning death, he alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness and everlasting life. So the context of this has been Jesus had to be truly human and truly God because that was the kind of redeemer we needed. Um, and that was Jesus, that is Jesus. But why did the redeemer have to die? Well, because there was a need for someone to suffer the penalty of sin. Since death is the punishment for sin, Christ died in our place so that we did not have to. A fairly classic answer. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, pretty central, isn't it? He alone redeems us from hell and gains for us forgiveness of sin, righteousness and everlasting life. So important to draw from that, that it, he does not simply die to wipe away a, a sort of sin or a kind of the, the imprint of sin alone and then leave us where we are, but also to gain for us righteousness and everlasting life. And the text is Colossians 1, 21 to 22. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And question 25 next week is, does Christ's death mean all our sins can be forgiven? And the answer is yes, because Christ's death on the cross fully paid the penalty for our sin. God graciously imputes righteousness to us as if it were our own and will remember our sins no more. So now we will read from All Things for Good or A Divine Cordial by Thomas Watson. And we're starting chapter six, An Exhortation to Love God. And we'll read subsection one or section one, subsections uh, one to four. An exhortation. Let me earnestly persuade all who bear the name of Christians to become lovers of God. O oh, love the Lord, all ye he saints. Psalm thirty one twenty three. There are but few that love God. Many give him hypocritical kisses, but few love him. It is not so easy to love God as most imagine. The affection of love is natural, but the grace is not. Men are by nature's haters of God, Romans 1.30. The wicked would flee from God. They would neither be under his rules nor within his reach. They fear God, but do not love him. All the strength in men or angels cannot make heart the heart love God. Ordinances will not, do, will not do it of themselves, nor judgments. It is only the almighty and invincible power of the Spirit of God can infuse love into the soul. This being so hard a work, it calls upon us for the more earnest prayer, and endeavour after this angelic grace of love. To excite and inflame our desires after it, I shall prescribe 20 motives for loving God. 1. Without this, all our religion is vain. It is not duty, but love to duty, God looks at. It is not how much we do, but how much we love. If a servant does not do his work willingly and out of love, it is not acceptable. Duties not mingled with love are as burdensome to God as they are to us. David therefore counsels his son Solomon to serve God with a willing mind. 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. To do duty without love is not sacrifice, but penance. Love to God is the most noble and excellent grace. It is a pure flame kindled from heaven. By it we resemble God, who is love. Believing and obeying do not make us like God, but by love we grow like him. 1 John 4.16 Love is a grace which most delights in God and is most delightful to him. That disciple who was most full of love lay in Christ's bosom. Love puts a verdure and luster upon all the graces. The graces seem to be eclipsed unless love shine and sparkle in them. Faith is not true unless it works by love. 
The waters of repentance are not pure unless they flow from the spring of love. Love is the incense which makes all our services fragrant and acceptable to God. 3. Is that unreasonable which God requires? It is but our love. If he should ask our estate or the fruit of our bodies, could we deny him? But he asks only our love. He would only pick this flower. Is this a hard request? Was there ever any debt so easily paid as this? Would you not at all impoverish ourselves by paying it? Love is no burden. Is it any labour for the bride to love her husband? Love is delightful. And four, God is the most adequate and complete object of our love. All the excellencies which sky, that lie scattered in the creatures are united in him. He is wisdom, beauty, love, yea, the very essence of goodness. There is nothing in God can cause a loathing. The creature sooner surfeits and satisfies, but there are fresh beauties sparkling forth in God. The more we enjoy of him, the more we are ravished with delight. There is nothing in God to deaden our affections or quench our love. No infirmity, no deformity, such as usually weaken and cool love. There is that excellence in God which may not only invite, but command our love. If there were more angels in heaven than there are, and all these glorious seraphim had an immense flame of love burning in their breasts to eternity, yet they could not love God equivalently to that infinite perfection and transcendency of goodness which is in him, Jesus Christ. Surely then, here is enough to induce us to love God. We cannot spend our love upon a better object. The thing that struck me most from there was the idea that if God should ask our estate or the fruit of our bodies, could we deny him? If God said, oh, I would like you to give me this, you'd always say, well, yes, God has the right to ask me for that, so I'll give it. But he asks only our love. He would only pick this flower. Is this a hard request? And of course, of course, Watson says, well, actually, you need the spirit of God for it. But then you need the spirit of God for any true obedience. So in that sense, the spirit of the love is the easiest thing because it's the first most impulsive thing. Uh, and I think, well, it's why Watson says we should pray most for it because it is the thing we most need. It is the simplest thing to God. It is the first thing we give God. It is a cheaper thing to give than our bodies or our property. But nonetheless, it is something only God can give to us. OK, then, well, we'll read Romans 7, verses 7 to 25, and then we'll go through a study on it. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means, yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the Lord had not said, the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it's good. So now it's not, no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is good, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. 
So in the previous passage, Paul has given what seems like a condemnation of the Jewish law. That's in 7, 1 to 6. The law cannot produce life, he says. It produces death because it increases knowledge of sin and therefore increases the burden of sin. But Paul believes the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament and that Jesus has fulfilled the Old Testament law, which is why he can save us. So Paul must now explain why God's law is not evil, given it seems to only help sin grow. Interestingly, Paul does not do this in a strictly technical way. In a, it, he does it in a typically Pauline fashion, explaining <coughs> pardon me, why the law is in fact good in a manner that is quite technical, but expressed in an experiential fashion, what the Puritans would have called an experimental manner. You see that Paul's concern is about defending the goodness of the law in verse 7. Shall we say the law is sin? No, by no means. The law itself is not sin. But Paul, in verses 7 to 11, explains the role the law plays in the stoking up of sin. Paul explains, as an example, that he would not have known that coveting specifically was sin if the law had not listed it as a sin. I in the commandments. That doesn't mean that Paul would have been free of a sinful nature, however, see verse 8, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment. Paul had a sinful nature, sin was in him, but sin needed the opportunity uh, to grow. Sin was there, waiting, prowling, and Paul personifies it, it was waiting. It already exists, it's already a danger, and it seizes an opportunity through the commandment. Where does it exist? How does it seize the commandment? Well. It was in Paul, it was original corruption descended from Adam's corruption. That was a poison in Paul. Paul was already federally condemned under Adam. We talked about that several weeks ago. His own nature, inherently corrupt as it was, was also condemned. Paul was already damned without any grace. But no additional personal sin could be reckoned to Paul's record without commandments that he was breaking. Do you see what I mean? That there was a an inherent stain, there was a federal condemnation, uh, but you could not then add that Paul was under a personal condemnation as to personal sin. He was under personal condemnation as to federal sin, but not for personal sin. And um, this is actually why it is reasonable to distinguish um, when sin happens in a person's life, uh, or wh wh whether it's sin. I, a newborn, crying and demanding attention. Um, cannot be said to have the same conscious aspect or element of sin that um, an older child or an adult doing something similar would have. The child, though they are condemned by God in Adam, though they have original corruption that leads to their vulnerability and fragility, nonetheless are not necessarily guilty of any personal sin uh, in, in screaming when you're trying to sleep. But the point is, of course, that God's grace comes uh, most of all, really, for that, that kind of overarching condemnation that takes it, sucks us all in and brings death into our, our whole race. Anyway, that's what Paul means in verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. There was nothing that he knew condemned him. He was ignorant. He believed himself, incorrectly believed himself, free and happy. The law promised life, verse 10. So look at Proverbs uh, 7, verse 2. Keep my commandments and you will live. God says, but no one is good, not even one, as Paul quotes from the Psalms back in chapter three. We are dead in our transgressions, as he says in the letter to the Ephesians. So instead, the commandment proved to be death to Paul. Sin could use it as a lure for active personal transgression on Paul's part. Verse 11. And Paul gives the mini conclusion in, in verse 12, which is a long way off 25. But it's the mini conclusion. The law is holy. All it did was highlight Paul's sinful nature. The commandments were good. They pointed to good things. The problem with indwelling sin in Paul was in Paul, not the commandment. That's verse 13. Did that which is good bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. Is this all there is to be said on the matter? Paul thinks not. In fact, he's going to use this very problem of the law to highlight the law's goodness and its purpose from God. Uh, he begins this point in the second half of verse 13. In order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. In order means that the purpose of sin producing death through the law was so that sin might be shown to be sin. 
Did innate sin in some strange way consciously try to expose itself? Well, by no means. The obvious actor to look to here is God. God gave the law so that indwelling sin might be exposed, so that, through the commandment, it might become sinful beyond measure. It would be exposed, impossible to hide or deny. What good is this? Well, one, it glorifies God because it spells out further reasons the wicked deserve punishment. The sin is only ever hiding their sin, in a way. But Paul suggests a second, more important reason here. Verse 14, the law is glorified, is spiritual, it's from God, but Paul says that he, Paul, is of the flesh, sold under sin. Paul uses flesh as a negative term in his letters, indicating a state of the soul and being in nearly every case he uses the term. So here he is saying his nature is fleshly, evil, corrupt. The law is good by nature, Paul is bad by nature. Paul doesn't understand what he does and he doesn't do what he would prefer to do. Instead, he does what is evil. He does things he hates. And that's interesting. Paul says by verse 17 that in fact it's not Paul who does the sin, but the indwelling sin within him that is sinning. Paul suggests a division within himself. Now it's interesting because elsewhere in another le in other letters he says the good that he does that's in his life does not come from him but Christ. Galatians 2.10, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.10 both say that. So this is not a literal division between Paul and a thing called sin. Uh, in the same way it's not a literal division between Paul and a thing called Christ. Um, it's that Paul is saying there's these spiritual things at war within him. It's interesting because by verse 17 Paul says it's not Paul who does the sin but the indwelling sin within him. Right we said that. So he's discussing the spiritual division within himself between his spiritually renewed self that wants to do things to please God and his corrupt old flesh between Christ and sin. The fact that Paul emphasises so strongly that he wants to do good, I have the desire to do what is right, it suggests strongly that he is indeed talking about his renewed self, not the general unsaved person. This is a debate about this passage. Is this in fact about the non-Christian who hasn't been saved and, and therefore is helpless against sin or is it about the saved person? But Paul says the unrenewed person is given over to their sin. That's chapter one. They've exchanged the truth for the lie. They love perversion instead. But Paul says he doesn't want to live in sin. He loves God's law. He desires to do what is right. So something has clearly changed in him. Now, he says, if I do not do what I want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 20. The renewed Paul is not sinning, but there is some element of his nature which is not renewed. The higher self, the soul if you like, is alive, but nonetheless there is still this mark of death on him. And Paul is getting on to the point of this. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. That's verses 22 to 23. The Jewish law, Paul says, and indeed um, it drew, you know, it drew and it indeed draws attention, Paul's attention, our attention, to the sin in his life. It made him realise that though his mind was renewed, his flesh, in that special sense, was still burdened by sin. The law proves to him that he's not all sorted. It highlights the death that dwells inside. Therefore, he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The law leads to Paul crying out in need. That it multiplies his sin, that it so that it, it, it multiplies his sin, so it might be shown to be sin, is good because it leads to him crying out, because there is a solution and a saviour. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, he cries out, and so is saved. Paul will actually make this point in chapter ten, where he repeats the Old Testament line that he who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the great purpose of the Jewish law for salvation, Paul says, and this is, it implies, something that applies to Christians of any background, not just from a Jewish background. So Gentile Christians, this applies to. The good, great purpose of the Jewish law for salvation is that it highlights sin. If we can see how far we fall short of God's moral law, we will know how much we need salvation. And that makes the first few books of the Old Testament of profound importance to the Christian. Uh, for, for other reasons too, in fact, but for this reason, very significantly. 
Now, Paul finishes the section in an odd way. He reiterates the dynamic of the Christian life he's drawn out. But it's in the present tense. He says, thanks, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He serves the law of God with his mind. That's happening now. But he follows the orders of sin with his flesh. He says this because he is about to discuss. Because that's worrying. It's something that's frustrated and upset him. Um, he has thanked God for salvation through Christ, but it's still a cause of anguish. But he says it because he's about to discuss how Christians can be assured of salvation. So he wants to sum up the tension that not just he, but all Christians must feel in their day-to-day -day life. And that is where we will get to next week in chapter 8.